Welcome to the Next Level Casino Careers Show, a series highlighting industry tips and insights from the best minds in the casino and hospitality industry. Enjoy the show. Kate White, how are you doing today? I'm great. So happy to be here. Uh, I'm so happy you agreed to do the podcast. Um, your insight, your story, the corporate vice president of business intelligence and I team program management for Penn National Gaming. And that's a big title. So I know you have a lot of ro roles and responsibilities under you. So to take 45 minutes or so today to chat with us, uh, once again, just to start, I just appreciate you taking some time. I think it's great. I'd love to IT nerd out with you. So let's do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and there's a lot, uh, a lot of headlines grabbing attention as it relates to business intelligence and IT. So I think like I said, your story is going to be important and the advice you can offer to people within casino and hospitality is going to be greatly appreciated. So let's start with who you are. You know, we always say the origin story, the three to four minutes, where you grew up, what your early interests were, how you found your career, and ultimately what you do today. So if you wouldn't mind connecting the dots for our listeners today. Sure thing. So uh, I am almost a native Las Vegas. Um, I, uh, was actually born on the East coast. My dad, super interesting, uh, moved us out West at a very young age because he worked in uh, nuclear, uh, waste. And so we came out to Las Vegas. I've been here ever since. So, um, I grew up, uh, on the East side of town, loved it. Uh, I actually was the first year of the millennium scholarship from, um, from Nevada, which is amazing. They send kids to school if you stay in state. So I actually got a free education, but I went to Reno. Uh, which was awesome. I learned seasons and a lot going on up there, uh, but still same very vibe um, uh, from a Las Vegas and gaming perspective. So it was around me my whole life. I graduated. Um, I originally was going to be a teacher, which was uh, really interesting and decided they were very undervalued. And so I uh, changed courses uh, during my uh, last couple of years of college and decided that I wanted to get into more of the business side of IT. Um, I always had a, a, an interest from a young age just around technology. I seemed to acclimate to it. So I graduated uh, and came. I actually took a, f a first job uh, writing code and uh, was a consultant and realized I was really bad at it. Um, there's a there's a skill set to being a heads down developer, which I'm not good at. So I did that for a little while, uh, ended up coming back to Las Vegas shortly after. Um, and I started working for a company called Vegas.com. Um, and I was there for about 12 years and it was amazing. Uh, I learned it's a smaller company. So I learned a lot. I wore a lot of different hats technology wise. Um, so it was, it was a great, uh, kind of starter, uh, new and career experience. And then I decided, okay, well, this has been fun. Let's get into gaming. Uh, which again, as you grow up here, you kind of hear is faux pas. Don't do that. Uh, and I, uh, I interviewed a, a couple places and decided, man, this sounds like a challenge. And I started with, uh, pinnacle entertainment. Uh, here in Las Vegas at the Corporate Service Center in 2016, and I have been um, on the roller coaster ever since. So we did some M&A and got bought out by Penn Entertainment a couple years later. Um, but at Penn, I, I mainly focus um, on BI, um, kind of the, the reporting of the business. So uh, it's pretty awesome. We get to kind of ingest all of the different data that happens at the properties and report back out and give that to leaders um, running dashboards and different types of analytics around kind of the, how is the business performing? What are we expecting? Things like that. And then uh, a couple of years ago, I also added program management, which is what makes my title really, really long, um, around how to execute it projects. So that's been really great. It's been really fun. I've been focused on a couple of really, um, high, high end projects like cashless and things like that. So it's been really, really interesting to, to live on both sides of that. So that's the, the basis of origin, but a lot going on there. Kate, there's a lot going on there. There's a lot to unpack. A couple notes I create that I want to come back to. I, I think your insight is critical because a lot of times there's a lot of insights out there, but how do you turn insights into action? Yes. Um, and then also too, innovation in general, I just feel like has really taken off the last few years. So I want to pick your brain there, but I want to go back to something you said in your story, which was a, a common topic that comes up for people who message us and different panels we've done is pivots and changing career. You mentioned you had interest in being a teacher and then you went into coding and then you realized that wasn't for you. I guess my broad question is, 
How do you know, looking earlier in your career when you have made those pivots, when do you know it's time to change? And also looking back, how valuable were those kind of stops in your career ultimately to what you do today? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would tell this to a lot of a lot of my employees as well. Flexibility is key. So when you when you find a passion for something, you get very excited. Um, I was very excited. I thought I was going to be a, a coder and, and build things. And, and I got into it and realized I just had a weakness. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't because I wasn't trying. It just it, I started getting into it and I just couldn't maintain the passion for what I was trying to do. And so at that point, I made the decision to say, OK, do I keep doing this knowing that it's not really where I want to be? Or do I just take a leap of faith and be flexible and try something new? Um, that has been a theme throughout all of my career. Um, raising my hand uh, is is kind of a, a something that I'm very familiar with. So I said, hey, I just want to try something new. I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and take the leap. I did that a couple of times throughout um, you know, being earlier in my career to, to raise my hand, to jump into something maybe I didn't understand as well, but said, Hey, I'll give it a try. If I can get it 80% right, I'm going to feel successful. Um, especially trying new things. So pivoting is probably my, my favorite word and has done a lot for me specifically in my career, just to get where I am today. And, um, you know, over time you kind of find your, your sweet spot and that's, it's been, it's been great for me. It's been very educational. <laughs> Um, would you recommend that to anybody? So anybody who's early in their career, maybe thinking about pivoting is your word is your advice, if I'm hearing you correctly, just to kind of put yourself out there and raise your hand. Cause I think a lot of times people might not do that because of failure or because maybe I don't have a strong interest there. So how do you find that balance of raising your hand, but also understanding maybe the potential sacrifice involved with that? Um, any words of wisdom there? Yes. So definitely, I would say majority of the time, always going to recommend trying something, try it, try it once. Right. A lot of the times we'll find, especially, you know, I'll, I'll speak to the theme of being a woman in it a lot, right. Um, raising my hand, being the only female in the room, you know, it was not an easy decision to make and not everyone would probably have been able to do the same thing. Um, so it's, it's not a decision you make lightly either. So there's a certain amount of finding that correct timing to say, yes, I am ready to make that leap. Because a lot of the times, especially when giving advice to young, young women in career, they're so eager, but maybe the timing is not right. There's a lot else going on for you. There might be some other skill sets you need to acquire, things like that to focus on initially to where you'll get to the point to say, a pivot is the only thing that makes sense now because I'm, I'm to my precipice of where I need to go and I'm ready to take the leap. So a lot of it is just, the timing of when when you do those things and and how you execute on them because as soon as you make the decision to do it you gotta jump you can't think back you can't double double back or second guess yourself you really just gotta go for it and give it your best understanding that it may not always work out but you're gonna learn a ton along the way i, I want to mention that because i know you're really involved with global gaming women and you just speaking about that and it made me think of this stat and I, I know i have this wrong but it's something along the lines of men will apply for a job where maybe they only have 20 percent of the whatever the skill set is much and then women it's like it has to be much higher for them to even consider it or apply yes why yeah. do you think that is and what words of advice would you make to kind of bridge that gap because i think that's an important point that no matter who you are i think there is a little bit of homework you need to do and a skill set and foundation you need to build to raise your hand so to speak but also at the same time, understanding you're never going to be 100 percent ready to raise your hand. So how do you find that balance or what words of wisdom would you provide on that front? Yeah, I think that's that's definitely a quote and a stat we use frequently because a lot of the career advice we give is driven around just have some confidence in yourself uh, a lot of the times. And, and whether we want to say it's, you know, gender or, or whatnot, a lot of the times women just don't look at themselves having the same skill sets or, or maybe not as polished. Whereas men will walk into a room and just and kind of fill up the room and, and feel confidence that, that they can execute on whatever is in front of them. Um, so a lot of the times we say, hey, that, that's a mental state for yourself. So you have to, again, be at the right mental state. So maybe you, won't, you don't want to apply right now. Maybe you're not ready. But like we said, sharpen the skills, go back and look at the job rec again and say, what are some of the things I doubted myself on? spend the next couple of months really garnering that. And then once you feel confident again, just start driving 
start, start driving your own bus, right? Telling your leaders that you're ready, raising your hand and saying, okay, I'm not to, I'm, I'm to a point where I, I feel confident and I'm ready to take the next step. So you don't have to wait for the next opportunity. Start making your own opportunities when the timing is right. That's, that's a lot of what we focus on. Yeah, absolutely. And it kind of mirrors something I said to somebody the other day, because I've had people around public speaking and some people are like, I'm just not a big public speaker. That's not my space. I don't feel comfortable there and I don't want to. Right. And I think it's to your point, if I'm hearing you too, it's individualized. It's based on the individual. Right. That doesn't mean that you need to just go and speak all the time. But finding those intentional spots to make your voice heard, I, I think, is critical for anybody who's trying to build on their career. Yeah. And know what you're good at. Right. And yeah. understand what you're not good at. I think that's a it's a great I, I use that as an interview question all the time. What are you not good at? Let's talk about that because that's really where you focus. Um, so I don't have a problem with public speaking. That's no big deal. But I did have to do a lot of coaching around conflict. It's something that I know I'm not good at. And I know as a leader, I had to to work on my relationship with conflict and how I handle it, how I how I help and support my employees with conflict. So everybody has what they're good and what they're they're not so good at. So you just focus on growing, growing yourself continually throughout that. And and yeah, that's everybody's individualized. Everybody's going to have their own kind of struggle bus. So we just find out what yours is and, and work on it. So, Kate, that's a perfect segue. Um, if that's your struggle bus, or at least it was conflict, how have you worked on that? Because I don't think that's the specific uh, uh, Kate opportunity. I think most of us as leaders struggle with conflict and especially as you start to manage people. So how have you kind of bridged that gap and helped as it relates to handling conflict in the workplace? Sure. Yeah. Not an easy one. Um, especially I, I tend to be a very open hearted type person. Uh, and I found that I would, I would retreat a lot when conflict would come and, and people would say, that's not how I expected you to act. I thought, you know, you walk in a room, you're a lady boss, you can handle it. And I'm no, no, everybody has a little bit of what they can do. So I actually, um, I did some emotional intelligence, um, specific training for myself. Um, and I did that global gaming women offer some great stuff there as well. So I took a couple courses, um, and learned a ton about my reactions to things and how I'm, how I'm reacting not only to others and situations, but um, how I can how I can kind of self be more self aware, um, and a lot of it was just talking myself down a little bit in the time of of you know if there's conflict going around you, how are you going to really get your m frame of mind correct before you respond or before you approach the situation? So I had to do a lot of inner self. Um, self help. <laughs> but I think emotional intelligence training is amazing for anyone, male, female, any industry. Uh, it really just helps frame your, your own self and, and what your, where your strengths and weaknesses are and, and kind of helps you understand the steps to take to get towards handling some of your struggles that, um, they never really go away, but you, you have tactics to handle them. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for sharing. I, I think there's a lot people could take there. And to your point, um, something that's been helpful for me is, you know, we did, some of us did a 360 review. Yeah. And a lot of times people talk about self-awareness and you think you can know yourself, but your perception might be different than what others think. So getting yeah. feedback from others, especially people you trust, um, that can go a long way too. Um, Kate, I want to switch gears a little bit. So we talked about your role. I'm going to read it again because it's, it's a mouthful, but it's important. Corporate Vice President of business intelligence and IT program management for Penn National Gaming. In a nutshell, the most important function of your current role is blank. Ooh. Uh, I would say the most important function of any role of, of a manager or leader is, is growing and supporting your staff. I think that's absolutely what I would focus on most of my day. Um, when you decide to become a people leader, you you make that commitment to supporting the people um, that work for you and, and their success. Um, I, I double fold on that and say, if it wasn't people related, innovation is my number, my number two. Uh, this industry has a lot of uh, runway for opportunity in, when it comes to innovation and coming from an outsider, not in gaming my entire career and having a different perspective. Uh, is is absolutely imperative to what we do day to day to be able to kind of drive this industry forward. So, I love it. People and innovation. Yes. And I think both are growth oriented. So, 
for you, because because I want to actually double click on something you said there, which is coming into gaming. So now looking back, are there any surprises or anything that operators or leaders need to think about that's just different in gaming or any surprises as it relates to just operations, innovation, kind of the world that you're in? Now looking back, any surprises or anything that was like took you a while to adjust to entering gaming? Yeah. Um, like what didn't surprise me, right, about gaming. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, specifically, I didn't understand the breadth, right? When you come in, you think, oh, this is my job. I'm supposed to do this one function. No big deal. Uh, I came in and said, wow, there is so much else going on um, with an operator that I had no idea. Uh, you know, when you think about who's selling the hot dogs and who's working with the guest front line, who's doing HR. I mean, there's so much that happens behind the curtain of, of a casino uh, that I think coming in, people don't realize what it actually means to be a cog in that machine. Um, I think one thing to focus on is how awesome that was for me to be able to say, I am, I'm intrigued about all of these things. So the challenges were kind of all over the place and to be able to jump in and, and really want to learn about all of those different functions really helped set the tone for me to be able to basically understand how the business works and engage in so much more um, just than what my role was um, specifically. On that front, I love the analogy of behind the curtain. Yeah. I think all of, uh, everyone listening to this podcast can relate. You know, there's just so many different avenues within gaming, hospitality, entertainment, the space that we're in. So many different departments to what you pointed out, uh, like the hot dogs, who's selling the <laughs> hot dogs, to the who's filling the theater, to uh, HR, to, I mean, the list goes on and on and on, even on the marketing side, which I'm on, right? It's not just advertising or database, it's guest service, it's VIP services, it's player development. Like, there's so many different facets. So that's a long-winded way to ask the question of priorities. So how do you, as somebody who works with so many different stakeholders, and to your point, I feel like we can all agree within gaming, as excellent as our service is or our product is, there's always so much room for improvement. So how do you go about, or what words of advice would you give to others to better partner with IT business intelligence? to start to under, understand the priorities of the department or the business so that you're not overwhelmed. Because I think, at least for me, working with different IT stakeholders, right? There's just so many different tickets. There's <laughs> this whole inventory of things that I know we all want to get done, but mm -hmm. words of wisdom from you to how can we better par partner with operators to really move the needle and get things done? How do you look at priorities? Take the question where you want. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question because I would like to say that BI is in pretty high demand across all of these different areas, right? Um, and some of that is, is, and frankly, what we look for is, is open mind. So who is willing to have a conversation about how to change how they do business using information, using data, you, you know, automating things, really kind of taking a technology um, focus to how they want to be better. So a lot of how we prioritize our time is, who wants to partner with us to get to that next step and who's willing to change a little bit about what they do and how they do it and let us let us in under the hood to to be able to make things better so um huge huge on partnerships um just uh, again huge on people that are saying hey i want to take us to the next step and i'm willing to 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 change how i do things it'll change management um to to get behind that for you because the worst thing to do is bring someone in and say yes we'd like to innovate but then not be willing to actually you know make the changes required to get to that next step because it is scary there's a lot um trusting technology is is not always everyone's strong suit especially if you're a you know 20 year chef veteran and you, you you've never had to use anything before so a lot of that is going to take um, that partnership. And that's what we look for as we prioritize kind of what's going to take us into the next the next level is it's not just about ROI, which there is a lot about ROI, um, but it has to be a blend of how can we execute? Because if we have a really great idea, but no no backing to execute it, it'll fall and it's, it's never going to be successful. Would you say, um, just to stay on that point a little bit, would you say the biggest in any project or any large initiative as it relates to innovation, What's the one sticky point? Would it be change? Just the, the resistance of change of those involved or kind of 
what is the one kind of clog in the wheel or bottleneck that prevents success? Some of it is change and, and some of it is willingness to trust and, and um, kind of when you think about someone who's done the same job or the same operation for so long, asking them to even make a small change is, is sometimes a little bit harder. So for us, it's finding the leaders that want to drive that, that are driving innovation within their teams. Because an, a leader can definitely want to always move forward, but if they haven't really created and cultivated the culture with their teams to adapt to that change, that's going to be a huge piece. So it's not just a one, one stop shop. It's, it's got to be the whole, the whole entity is ready to kind of move forward. Um, and, you know, I think people will talk about going to the cloud a lot. We do that a lot, right? We're going to go to the cloud or we're going to automate this. Or we're going to do that. A lot of that's scary. So you finding leaders that are willing to cultivate that idea and really get behind it and sell it to the rest of their teams is the only way to make it successful. And uh, on that front, any words of advice or tips to get people on board? To your point, if you have a great leader who's kind of has this vision or in the sky and people are like, no way, or, yeah. that's, or that's too much, or I could barely do what I'm doing now. Like how, how do you get people motivated and on that train for that larger goal? Yeah. A lot of the times it's just education. It's just spending time with people. So I'll use an example. It's not even team members, but we're even trying to sell this cashless solution to some of our customers. Right. And a lot of it is, if I can explain it to you very similar to how you use Candy Crush on your phone or how you go to Starbucks and eat, you make it relevant to whatever audience it is. So whether it's a customer, it's just spending time with them to make them understand and also to, to really understand what's the value add for them. Because a lot of the times people are saying you're just making this change to make change, which is not the purpose of innovation. The purpose is we're making change to make things better for you better for our customers, better for our industry. So you kind of have to educate and sell them on what they're getting out of it. And most of the time, once you do that, once they feel like you've spent the time and energy with them, they're appreciative and they're willing to do a whole lot more at that point for you. That's such a great point and a perfect pivot because I did want to talk to you about communication. And that's such a, a great tip is to, you know, one of my favorite quotes, I think it's Einstein is, uh, if you can't explain it simply, you don't know it well enough. To, to, and a lot of times we just talk over people's heads or we don't know the audience and we don't adjust our message. So using practical examples that everyone can relate to, or at least that audience can relate to, I think goes a long way, uh, no matter what you're trying to communicate. So I, I'm reading this from uh, your LinkedIn. On your first line uh, about you, you say responsible for aggregating and delivering real information to drive educated business making decisions. So that first point, I think, is super valuable, and I want to unpack it a little bit. So when it comes to delivering real information, I think real is important there. Kind of what is the evolution of your career as it relates to driving real information that affects the business versus maybe information that's empty calories, so to speak? Like, how have you kind of improved on that with the teams that you work for? Sure, sure. And I think that's that's a huge specifically for this industry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I when I came into this industry, you know, however many years ago, uh, we used to have this this book, you know, that GMs would walk around with and it's got all your, your stats in it and it's printed on paper. And I would just look at this and say, hey, how are you adding value if you're, you know, scrolling through 75 pages at a time trying to find one number, you know, things like that. So when it comes to real information, it's what can I provide you that's top of mind, value add for for right now, situational, but also start highlighting some things to you that you should be looking at. So a big focal point for us is if you're a marketing leader, here's the main things you should be working at because it drives the business for you specifically. Um, and I don't, I don't need you to go look for it anymore. I'm going to put it in your face. I'm going to say, this is what's important. I'm going to, I'm going to drive it home to you all the time not only visually, but also allowing you to say, okay, I understand what my KPIs are. It sounds funny, but a lot of people just don't understand what's value add for them. And so um, kind of making that, that qualification of data being, you know, what's important to me. And then also saying, how am I going to use that? So giving real world examples and bridging between, I'm not just providing you data, I'm giving you something to make a decision with 
because it's going to, it's going to improve, you know, kind of your situation without you having to go back to this book and look through 75 pages of something to find the answer. So we're providing answers in real time about what's prevalent right now, instead of this kind of historical view of things. Yeah. And has that been a constant evolving evolution? Because going back to the 75 page document to find a number versus whatever it looks like today, what involves, what is involved to get to that point? What I'm getting at, I guess, is it is a collaboration mm -hmm. or is it more so just, you know, your team being experts and really understanding the true KPIs that matter. Talk to me a little bit about that as far as, you know, people listen to this podcast are wondering if they are partnering with their business intelligence, FP&A, whoever's providing them data, right? Yeah. Like how can they continue to evolve in a way that's really taking what I said earlier in the podcast, insights that can deliver action? Yeah, I think that's huge because IT is nothing without the business, right? I think it's a lot of the times we have to go back and, and level set. We are not the experts when it comes to how you're running your business. And we can definitely garner insights from the data that that just says, you know, factually or, or based on patterns, this is the stuff you should look at. But when it comes to the day to day, you understand what your struggles are. You understand your problem statements and collaboration. And, and in our case, like the engagement model that you have with with the folks that can answer those questions for you and, and what questions are being asked is absolutely pivotal. So I always tell people, uh, you know, bug me. Uh, you know, bring me your, your situations, tell us about something that you don't have, because we can, can only continue to enhance based off what you need to keep, continue improving your operations. And I don't know that without you. So building those partnerships and, you know, I, IT has historically not always been known to be a really collaborative, you know, kind of environment. But when you think about now, look at the news, right? I mean, we're in a very different state. 90% of what goes out in the news is about technology. So, so many more, um, you know, individuals are, are educated about technology just in general. So uh, it, it, the gap is much smaller. The bridge is much smaller than it was in the past. Don't, don't be afraid to come over and knock on the, on knock on the door and start asking questions and be really uh, inquisitive. Uh, it, it, it helps us to, to really create the right path on how we get to the next thing. Well said. That's great advice, Kate. I want to jump to a segment we call the bigger picture, where I'm going to show a picture and we're just going to riff. It could be a picture. It could be a headline. But this one is all over the place, right? Everyone's talking about generative AI, chat GPT. So if I have someone who's worked in technology and the role that you're in, that'd be perfect to discuss. So when you see these headlines, you know, and I feel like I picked two that are kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. There's ones that are looking at it more as an opportunity. So this one says generative AI, when an AI enabled workforce is a game changer for productivity. And then the other side of it is could AI threaten Gen Z's career prospects, college students reveal concerns. So you as a leader, how should your advice on how are you looking at this? Um, and ultimately how should future leaders and current leaders be thinking about this rapid uh, change of technology, chat GPT, everything that's making the headlines right now. Yeah, this is all the cool, cool words, right? Um, I think this gets right back to what we talked about in the beginning, Kyle, and that's all about pivoting. So, um, you know, again, our industry is not necessarily known for being very, you know, technology um, top of the spear, right? So when it comes to using AI and technology, I think we're, we're just starting to scrape the surface, but I mean, in, in our case, that just makes us more excited. It's not necessarily a threat. It's look at all of the potential that we could um, engage with given, given using some of this technology. So a lot of the times when people come in and say, hey, you know, AI might take away, um, you know, like we have a call center, right? AI might take away jobs and things like that. And it's like, instead of thinking about the threat, start thinking about the opportunity of yourself personally to say, okay, uh, maybe I'm not going to be doing the same thing I'm always doing. What can I add to my skill set to say now a value add once we get to the next stage of what technology is doing? So 
I might be heads down run, running a bunch of predictive models today, and that's going to be replaced with technology. Well, now I'm going to take it into the next step and learn the next thing. I'm going to I'm going to upskill myself so that I'm ready for whatever that that next um, engagement might be if technology does come in and, and replace certain things. But I think it's it's industry agnostic. It's going to happen everywhere. Um, and I think it's exciting. I've, I mean, maybe that's the inner nerd in me getting getting a little bit excited about something. But um, it's nothing to be scared about. Uh, I know my dad would say differently. <laughs> but um, but the the idea is that it's there. We should use it for the benefit of how it's going to make us all better, and focus on how we can start to supplement. Um, some things are never going to be replaced by computers. You know, we just talked about operators knowing their business and speaking to customers. There's a, there's a value add to some of that that, that can never be replaced with technology. Um, so we focus on those things and um, there's more than enough problems in the world to solve uh, than to be worried about one of them being replaced by chat DPT, right? Uh, I think there's there's a lot more on, uh, on deck to, to that we can start focusing on. Yeah, I wrote down so many good notes there. When you said value add, I just circled add. Yeah. Because I think that's worth expanding upon because I think as we look at these, it's I think I think it's easy to jump into replacement and things of that nature. Whereas really it's not or it's and, right? Like you can use like I've experimented with chat GPT and I was pretty shocked with communications wise, like some of the things that would spit out. Now it's not replacing that function, but it makes it more efficient. You know, so I think it's important for people to a point you made earlier is just to dabble with some of these things, get to know it and understand how you can use it to make yourself more efficient. And to your macro point, too, I think it's important to realize, like, this has been going on for a long time and not just this, but just evolution and change. I was listening to a podcast and, and this gentleman brought up. He's like, what do you think happened with farmers when the tractor came? You know, so. You can go every five to 10 years and there was some kind of evolution where it was probably scary, but it also creates other types of jobs, too. Correct. So um, I, I agree. And I think the word of advice I would give is just for people to experiment with it and know it. But um, to your point, I think it's more of an addition versus like a cancellation and we'll evolve from it. And it's going to create new opportunities for people, too, don't you think? Exactly. When I think of it, I think automation has been in every industry forever, right? How do we continue to innovate? How do we continue to automate things? That doesn't go away. Think about today, people that are manually running their forecast models, you know, you how much money am I going to make? And somebody's clicking buttons and doing different things. Now I'm replacing that with technology so that you can focus on doing deeper dive analysis on things, doing market share, doing other, other value add, exactly add. Um, items. I th there's a lot more opportunity than there is threat. And uh, it's going to be really exciting to see what happens. And we're going to depend on people to get on board with that because it is scary. Uh, but it's 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 going to be a fast, fun train as we go along with this. It's going to be really interesting. Yeah. And just one quick personal example. So this podcast would not even be possible without some of the tools we have available. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Canva, Anchor and StreamYard. It allows me to do this when I'm not working and also Serena too, you know, this would not have been possible 10 years ago. It would have taken a whole team, right? Whereas now these tools can help us be more efficient and launch this podcast and the platform much quicker. So I say all that to just recommend people to experiment like Canva, for example, I just did it as a way of creating birthday cards and little flyers. And then sure enough, I'm using it in strategic decks. And then I never knew I'd be using it to create ad mats. Right. But I think that the bigger point is, these technologies can open up possibilities that didn't exist before and really start to understand how can it help your business, right? So, and it's individualized for the person. Uh, Kate, I want to jump to this next slide, which is, sorry to have your picture up there twice, but uh, two, two awards that you've won within the last uh, two years, uh, 40 under 40 by uh, ELG, and then also you're recognized as Women Rising in Gaming under 40. Uh, Simple question here. What makes this recognition possible? What is, is to take your words, what's going on behind the curtain or the team around you that makes these kind of awards possible for you? Yeah. And, and a lot of these awards and, and are great. It's, it's 
it's phenomenal to be in the spotlight. It's, it's great to be there, but also this just gives more people passion to, to, you know, to be there as well. So a lot of the times I look at this and say, you know, it's great that my name is out there, but you know, can I go spread that to someone else to say, Hey, I want my name to be there in, in two or three years. Right. That's a lot what it's about. So a lot of this opportunity comes from my networking inside this industry. It's such a close knit family, uh, which you'd also don't see behind the curtain. Right. Uh, but people want you to succeed. So there's so much opportunity. Like this podcast is a great example. Um, you know, you don't necessarily see this in all industries, but you know, people actually care about other people in this space and tend to stay in this industry because you find um, really great people that want to mentor you and want to help you move forward. So I would not have any of this um, definitely without all of the leadership from from my side and, and my, you know, my leadership making women and gaming being a priority uh, all the way up to my CEO, which is amazing. And as well as organizations like Global Gaming Women, where you kind of build your own network of of people who are helping kind of push you up, which is um, which has been a value. I, coming into this industry blind is scary. Uh, there's a lot to learn and there's a lot to do, and it's it's just been um, it's been very very great experience for me um, with with having such um, great backing um, with all these different different places. So, okay, a subject that comes up a lot too is networking. Has that been pivotal to your success? And if so, has that always been a natural strong suit of yours or has that been kind of learned over time? Yeah, I would say it has been absolutely imperative to my onboarding and gaming. Um, I, you know, without that, I can't say I would understand half of what I understand about this business. You know, working for an operator, I needed to understand what's happening in manufacturing. Uh, I needed to understand what's happening in all these different types of places. And so my network uh, has been able to help me do that. And a lot of that is um, is personality and being able to put yourself out there, which has always been a little bit easier for me. I don't mind kind of making myself look like a fool and walking out to people and say, hey, what do you do? Tell me all about it. You know, so there's a little bit of that that definitely has been easier for me than some. I, I you know, I've, I've chatted with a, f a few ladies in Global Gaming Women who just don't have the aptitude for walking into a room and meeting other people. Um, but it's interesting because once they do it, they said, oh, that was really easy. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's zero pressure. Just introduce yourself. You're interesting. You, you don't have to feel like there's pressure to, to learn about someone else. So I would say absolutely throw yourself out there as many places and as, as many ways as you can educate yourself about all the different, um, different things going on and ask questions, just be inquisitive. I think that's the best, easiest part of networking is you don't have to even talk about yourself if you don't want to just walk in and ask a bunch of questions and learn a lot and you're going to grow. That's a key one. Just ask questions. I like that. Just start there. Uh, yeah. Cause I, I mean, I've struggled. I, I've said this openly on this podcast, like, I'm slightly a little more introverted. I'm not an extreme introvert, right? But like, just start you small, know. ask some questions. Great. And I, look what I'm doing on here, I'm just asking questions. So, um, Kate, I wanna come back to something you said earlier. Uh, you mentioned mobile wallet. So as you look ahead, uh, it could be mobile wallet, it could be take your pick. But yeah. what excites you for the future? Where are the opportunities within gaming where you think like we can take it to the next level? Like what energizes you uh, as you look forward, as far as the opportunity within gaming? Yeah, I think there's so much. So to really whittle it down, I think that the number one thing is we're, we're changing the way that we interact with our guests. Um, you know, walking into a facility and engaging with different kiosks and different types of machines. I mean, that's great. You can, you can still all do that. You want to make that experience, but we're changing the way that we offer, we, we, offer for new demographics. So now you can log in from home and deposit money on your wallet from your couch, because that's what you expect to do in different age groups, right? So we're diversifying kind of the offering. And I think that's huge. That opens up so much more opportunity for us innovating without disrupting the current um, kind of norm around um, retail gaming and, and specifically in our spot at Penn where it's, it's very localized, right? Um, so. I think that opportunity and creating that diversified kind of portfolio of options is exactly what makes everyone excited. Um, it opens up tons of, of spaces to say, well, let's work on our mobile app. Let's work on our web presence. Let's work on our social presence. I mean, all of that, the way that we talk to our customers, maybe we 
chat with them now instead of having to wait for them to come in. Um, maybe we're doing gift giveaways on our phone instead of long lines at the cage. You know, like there's a lot going on um, that we're taking feedback to say, how can we just use technology to try something out and see how it goes? So, 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 so much opportunity in that space. Um, and it's, it's going to go really fast. I think that's also exciting because we don't, we all kind of want to get to that, that next step from a, from a competitive set. So you're going to see a lot of the stuff run really fast to make sure that, you know, we're all, we're all going to get there sooner or later, but the, the fastest get there a little bit faster and, and kind of earn that customer base a little bit easier and upfront. So as a lot, it makes it exciting. So you talk about how fast you think it's going to go. So this is perfect set part two question in 2030. Kate White will be saying, looking back on 2022 or 23, sorry. In 2030, you'll look back and say the thing we underestimated the most in 2023 was what? The change in our customer base. So I think we've done business the same way for a long time and we've done really great business, um, but our, our consumer expectations are changing. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people are saying, yes and no at the same time you know kind of the that way but it's going to change so fast and it's the pace in which technology changes is going to change expectations so planning for that now is going to be really imperative and if we if we get out 10 years from now and we're like oh snap we need to start planning for that you're going to be way behind the race um just level setting the different types of customers we're going to have now and and what the expectation is from them and setting kind of the roadmap for the next five years is going to be absolutely the changing point for a lot of us. Thank you for, for answering that. And then I also want to pull on, so just day to day, when Kate gets out of bed, when you get excited to take on the work day, whatever that looks like for you, like what's your pool? Like what is the energy in your cup that keeps you kind of excited about staying in your role and staying in this career? Yeah, I think a lot of it is, and I got really lucky being in BI because I get to work with so many different people. Um, I mean, like we said, I have stakeholders all over the different types of business. So a lot of the times I'll get up and I don't have to necessarily, you know, work with the same people every day, which is great. I'll be working on a new project with someone in finance and I'll be excited because I don't understand anything about it. I'm going to go learn about it today so I can start making suggestions on how technology can help. A lot of that is, is kind of the is getting up and saying, hey, how can I help today? Um, and if I think that I can make something better, I have a passion for that. And I'm going to be able to, to really drive home, um, you know, bringing a, bringing a new light to something that maybe somebody hasn't done before. So me personally, that's what it's all about. If I feel like we can make change at all in any way, I'm, I'm up out of bed, ready to go. I got my five cups of coffee and I'm, we're, we're jamming <laughs> uh, to the future. <laughs> How can I help today? I like that. I, I think that's so simple, but I, that, that totally makes sense. The you know the more we talk in this conversation, um, passions outside of work. So, what's how does Kate turn her brain off? What 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 is kind of the things that excite you outside of your 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 position? Yeah, I think it actually is pretty much the same theme around how can I help? Right? I do. I think we. You know, I work a lot in the nonprofit community here in Vegas. Uh, I think that's another personal passion of mine. Uh, and just historically being in this town and watching it grow has been really, been really great. So I like to really get involved with that, with different types of things. And, um, you know, I, I, I publicly mentioned multiple times I have a, a nonverbal autistic son. So uh, that definitely makes things uh, very interesting on a day to day basis uh, outside of outside of work. So. Uh, just really following that and, and kind of understanding the, you know, what's the growth pattern for him look like and how can I support him along with kind of the work life um, balance piece of piece of everything. So I definitely stay busy. Yeah. So that's a, a, a perfect question. And thank you for sharing that. Cause like I said, we've done interviews before and people can relate and it's so important that people share their stories. So work life balance is also one of those common questions we get. So obviously being a mother, but also being so driven in your career, how's your approach to balance? Is there such a thing? And what would you recommend to others? 
I think it's really, really important to learn this early in your career. That's the number one um, kind of focus I, I tell people coming in is learn the balance early because the later and the longer it takes to get there, the harder it is to change. Um, but a lot of it is finding time to say, what are my priorities and assessing time to those priorities? Yes, I could work 24 hours a day if I let myself, but have boundaries, find those boundaries where I can still feel like I'm executing well in my career, but I'm, I'm assuring that I'm making the time to, you know, be a good mother, be a good wife. Um, I, you know, I have a really supportive um, family at home. So I think that helps a lot and not everybody has that same opportunity, but for me, I've been able to take that time and, and carve out, um, how I manage all that. So time management is really huge for me. Uh, I learned that really early on being very organized, but um, just generally assuring that I'm spending the time and, and making sure that everything has a, a, an adequate amount of how I'm focused um, and doing that early and, and then maintaining that throughout your career, because things are going to change in your career and le level setting expectations and kind of giving yourself a little bit of you know, leeway here and there. Um, again, nobody's perfect, but uh, you you do your best and you are proud of your best that you are giving and then you move on. You mentioned support from the family. So is that something when you mentioned, because I think that's great advice, having that earlier in your career, the better. Is that just open dialogue that you have with your family as far as being very open on what your career is, what your future goals are? To your point, things can change, but has that been foundational for you? Yes. I think setting, setting with them personally and saying, this is my goal. This is, this is something I'm passionate about. I want to strive in my career um, really early on, set the tone for how they wanted to help, how they could help frame. And I help them as well. Like, I think it becomes a, you know, everybody has different things that they're, they're really striving towards. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to help them as much as they're going to help me. But as long as you always keep it honest, so they're not afraid to call on call me out when I'm working a Sunday morning or or things like that because you do need to have some amount of truth um, with your home you know home board of directors uh, to keep everybody uh, in the same space and they do really well and open honest communication is absolutely the only way that that happens because uh, sometimes you do need someone to call call you on your own stuff and uh, and really family is is the best place to do that because um, you just you, you need it and, and they can do it without making too much, <laughs> too much of a thing with it. So home board of directors. I'm, yes. I'm, I'm stealing that one. I like that. I could, <laughs> you know, I have, uh, I have three kids myself and a wife and, you know, I, I can relate and I, I would offer the same advice as this really open dialogue. Um, because yeah, there's no matter what success looks like for you in life, there's always resistance. There's always a cost so to speak. So just being very open to that. And something I heard too was an article or a podcast. They talked about happiness and they said, happiness at the end of the day is not, you know, like super highs or super lows. It's really just about being content. And what content means are your basic needs met, right? Like that's contentment. And I think open dialogue is so foundational. And, and I love that you hit on that. Um, a few final questions here for you, Kate. And thanks again. Uh, this has been super valuable. Uh, favorite hobby or subject you nerd out on that maybe a lot of people don't know about? <laughs> uh, I happen to love like English lit. So I read a ton um, and uh, I nerd out a lot on kind of this Jane Austen era and I won't get into it, but it's, it's pretty nerdy. Uh, <laughs> I knit a lot. So I'm really like an 80 year old woman in a 40 year old body. Uh, so I do a lot of that. And it's, I think it's great because I love it. I can step out of my real world and, and kind of get into fiction and just, you know, do my thing. But uh, definitely the most boring person you've probably ever met outside. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, that is is probably the nerdiest thing about me that now everyone knows. So thanks a lot for bringing that up. <laughs> no, and I think it's, it's awesome because I think a knitting, I feel like <laughs> I would love to see a study. Is knitting and like IT work like, I bet there's a correlation there because what I'm getting at is it's very detailed, right? Like you have to go step by step and I just don't have that brain. I like, for example, <laughs> if I get an Ikea furniture set, I look at the pictures. I'm just like, how do we just get this done? Show me the YouTube video, right? Whereas knitting is the total opposite. You have to be Zen step by step. At least that's what it looks like. So I it bet definitely. there's a correlation there. 
so much zen. And my husband makes fun of me all the time because he's just like, I don't understand why you do this. And I, this is my happy place. I can knit, I can chill, no one's bothering me. It's just me and my yarn, I'm good. And it is precise. So it, it's it's building something, it's it's neat. It's, I, I thought when I was younger, I never would be that lady, but I am definitely that lady now. I don't have any cats though, just for the record. So we're good. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally get it. I think they call it flow, right? Yes. And then you can't be, I imagine you can't be knitting well and do something else. It's like, that's the only thing you're totally locked in. Um, <laughs> not to go on a tangent here, but have you heard about like, I think her name's like the Knit Queen on YouTube or anywho. Sure you she's look, amazing. If you her name look, is the Knit Queen, she's gotta be legit. That might not be her name, but you should look into it. She, okay. You can Google it. She's from Missouri um, and I forget the town. It's a small town, um, anywho. She started this local YouTube channel, just knitting and she built like an empire. To the point where in Missouri, she now owns like four restaurants. She has two warehouses, all from this little YouTube channel she launched where people now go to this small town in Missouri just to see her, see the plant. And it's just boomed the whole town. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. I'm not going to lie. The internet taught me how to knit. So it might have been the knitting queen. And I should give her all my royalties for everything that we're doing right now because yeah, <laughs> I would not know how to do anything without the internet right now. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll, I'll send you a link after this. Perfect. Uh, final two questions here. The one interview question everyone should prepare to answer, be prepared to answer is what? Yeah. My, my favorite one is always, you know, based on your career thus far, like what is your weakness? Um, cause I think a lot of people love to talk about what they're really good at during interviews and 50% of it is usually accurate. Um, but I want to talk about what you know you're not good at and that kind of emotional intelligence side to say, I'm working on this. I know I have, um, I'm, I'm willing to change that sort of thing. The, that's where you get the best answers. And if somebody says nothing, then you know there's probably some something missing there. As a hiring manager, why is that important though? Why do absolutely. That yeah, I think a lot of people, I hire a lot. Um, and different, different skill sets. And so it's not all about how do I, do I check the college box and do I check the, do I, can I write in these languages and do these things? It's, I can teach you so much more once you're in, do you have the aptitude to learn? Do you have the aptitude to change? Are you open-minded? Because those are the things that are really going to the longevity and create the longevity in the, in the culture that we have here, at least for me. Um, I could have a lot of captains, um, but really the, the ship runs a lot better with people that are willing to move around and do a lot of different things. And you have to be able self-aware of what you're good at and what you're not good at to, to work in a team. Yeah. And I think it's worth pointing out too. It's important for the person applying for the position. You're going to be much more comfortable if your future supervisor understands exactly what you need to work on, or maybe what you don't want to work on. And that level of trust and understanding each other is just going to create a better work environment so much better and coming in you know what you're getting i think a lot of the times people will just say yes i can do the job but um you know they're missing the qualification of how how to maybe they want to be a manager but they're not ready maybe they want the, you know the aspirations and the things that they're working on not necessarily what they know but where are you going to let me help you with that and if we're aligned on that you're going to be successful that's a great point uh, Kate, the final question, uh, we get everybody out of here on and thanks again for joining the podcast. I know this is gonna be valuable for our audience. Um, we're all about taking people's careers to the next level, understanding everyone's story is different, but getting little tips from everybody. So hopefully they can apply to their career. So for you, if you were going to provide three tips to take someone's career to the next level, what would those three tips be for you? Three tips learn everything and anything you can about the business that you're in or the business you want to get in. Um, absolutely pivot anytime you're being asked to pivot. Um, it's, it's so important and it worked for me and it'll work for a lot of others. And then really focus on, on yourself along the way, right? Don't forget about that work-life balance, set boundaries. You can be successful with all of those things. Um, with a combination of all of that, you're, you're really going to put yourself in a good position um, anywhere you go in any industry, really. So um, I think that's that's kind of the secret sauce. There you have it, Kate. Thank you for <laughs> taking the time today. This has been awesome. 
I'm going to send you that, that, uh, can't quote wait. video, or whatever her name is. <laughs> She's going to be my LinkedIn profile for a while now, just for you. <laughs> but thanks again. Uh, super appreciate it. Thanks for taking time today. Of course. Thank you. Have a good one. All right, you too. Check out more episodes on nextlevelcasinocareers.com.